Hi, I'm Fen Lilly, and you're listening to WRSUFM, New Brunswick, the home of Rutgers Radio. We could start off with some icebreakers. I was watching your bath time series yesterday. I went through like a binge watch, and I was inspired by your questions because. Every time I prepare for an interview, I'm like, I need to think of some philosophical, like, no one's ever asked this before question. And you, I think Lucy Dacus to you was like, what was your worst idea ever? And I was like, that's a genius <laughs> question. <laughs> so what's my answer? Do you like paper, paper sandals? Paper flip flops. Because I was allowed flip flops. Yeah. So yeah. on the flip side, I would love to know what you think your greatest idea ever was. Ooh, my greatest idea ever. Um, this is going to be like a rogue one, but I grew up on a farm mm. and we had loads of sheep. And when the sheep would give birth, they often had two lambs. Like that's a standard amount of lambs for a sheep to have. Um, and we'd like let them all out into the field. And then at the end of the day, we'd get them all back in and they'd sleep in a barn. But whenever we got them in, the sheep would arrive in the barn quicker than the lambs because they're slow and babies and then there'd be like an hour where the sheep are trying to find which kids belong to them and it's like hectic and so loud and they're all just like screaming for their babies and eventually they sort it out but I came up with this idea called lamb attach where you have like a a band of velcro around a sheep and then you have like the opposite velcro for the lambs and you just stick them on the side of the sheep and they don't get lost <laughs> And I genuinely floated this idea to my parents as something we should actually make happen. And we didn't because we're all Aquarius and don't get stuff done. But um, yeah, I genuinely think that's a really good idea. So if any farmers are listening to your, <laughs> your stuff, then uh, yeah, go with it. But I want 10%. I want 10%. <laughs> At least. Like that Shark Tank pitch. Like this <laughs> is lamb attached. When I bring my sheep in, I'm like, this sheep hasn't got its kids, <laughs> but it could with lamb attached. Yeah. <laughs> okay. So, Good question. did you just say that you were an Aquarius? So are you like super into astrology? No, but I realized that most of the America is, and I had, I just had lunch with my friend who's like also, she's just met a, an Aries, and she thinks that's a really good sign. Um, so I, it's on my mind now. My sister always sends me like astrology Instagram posts and I'm like, you have to remind me what I am again before I... <laughs> <laughs> I'm really glad that you're on the same page as me because I feel like I, I speak ill of it often because it's become such a massive talking point. Like people are always bitching about Scorpios and I don't get it because the person I'm in love with is a Scorpio and they're fine. So <laughs> I don't... <laughs> I don't agree with that judgment, but yeah, it feels, I don't know, maybe people are just relying on it because it's like the, I don't know, we're relying on things that are not fully based on fact because the actual world is really scary at the moment. So I don't know. I was open to it and then I signed up for like CoStar and Patter and like the whole nine yards. And it was just like fun to see like where I compared with my friends. But then you yeah. start getting those horrifying push notifications from them that really make you like in the middle of the day, unwarranted, like, do you have communication issues? And it's like, damn, I guess I, I guess. Yeah. Uh, do you want to help with that? Or do you just want to point out everything that's going to go wrong for me in the next five hours? Like you get those ones that's like, you need to be careful with money. I'm like, oh no, fuck. <laughs> and now I'm like, okay, astrology, just because those apps really bother me. I still get the notifications though. That's super invasive. I remember getting it cause I was dating someone and I wanted to see because we had this instant connection. I was like, maybe there's something in the stars. <laughs> there wasn't. <laughs> and, and then he turned out to be an asshole. But yeah, it's, 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 a good, it's a good tool to use for entertainment reasons. But then as soon as you start basing your like actual life trajectory on it, it becomes, I think, unhealthy. Next, your favorite reality TV shows. Like plural? Or your like top one go-to. Okay, well, when I was in the States, I watched a lot of Naked and Afraid. That was like my, my yeah, go-to. Really I just wish that they didn't blur everything. <laughs> like it's, I mean, I can get what they do, but also like if I was gonna find it sexy, like I would just watch porn. Like there's no real, I don't know. I think I feel like they're shooting themselves in the foot and 
negating the point of it. Also, it would be a cool move to be like, let's desexualize the naked body and mm -hmm. just have naked people on TV. That would be cool. Um, I also think I would do really well on that show. I just think I would, so. Why is that? You're not the first person who said this to me. Um, firstly, I think I can, I pinpoint everything that anyone does wrong on it. Okay. Like I, maybe that's just a classic, like watching something is easier than doing it, but um, I don't know. And I just think I'm built tougher than everyone who's ever been on that show. Not to be <laughs> smug, but I genuinely believe that I'm stronger than them. <laughs> mentally emotionally maybe not physically but yeah um i'm also watching a lot of the do you have come dine with me in america you don't um it's this show where the season i'm watching right now is couples come dine with me so there's three couples and they all host a dinner party um in like on like consecutive nights and then they judge each other but there's so much drama it's utterly insane and it's almost like a weird play like you get these six people that would never normally meet and they all have completely different opinions on stuff and often I think the producers choose people who are definitely going to clash yeah. and there's like fully fights and it's just brilliant it's so unnatural and it's so brilliant and no one's really taken the piss out of it. it's not like the x factor where you get like a sad delusional person who's just made to look awful on live tv f to make money it's like these people are just the worst and no one's pointing out to them they're just like the worst obliv obliviously it's really good um i think we have a version of that but it's weddings so different people will go to other people's weddings and it'll be like some sort of competition i haven't watched it in a while but it was like brutal yeah that yeah wedding good. stuff is is good i was gonna say there's a show called um don't tell the bride <laughs> i think i mention this every single bath time episode because it's honestly so funny oh. where the man will plan the wedding and he's always like i'm gonna push her out of her comfort zone and we're gonna go bungee jumping and she's like i just want to be pretty and it's really funny and he always blows the entire budget on like a huge stag do and she like goes to a cafe with her friend it's so <laughs> bad <laughs> But yeah, I'm really good. Do you have any notes on your phone of high thoughts that you can share? Oh, so many. Oh, yes. So many. I don't know why I wrote this down, but I assume it's because I, I feel like at some point I'm going to make this into a piece of physical art. I wrote Statue of Limitations. <laughs> like, a, like a statue. <laughs> and I probably thought it and then like laughed out loud. And wrote it down and was like, I'm oh, brilliant. <laughs> um, uh, I was going to start, a, if I ever have a record label, I was going to call it Sleepy Creeps, which I thought was a really good name for something. Um, <laughs> I've got a dream note, oh, which I, I remember that. writing down in the middle of the night, like I was stoned and then I went to sleep. And then normally when I'm stoned, I don't have dreams, mm -hmm. but this time I like had a really vivid dream and then woke up in the middle of the night, still stoned. And then I wrote this. Um, dreamed that man left this toweling fabric t-shirt behind. Someone wouldn't come to my show because they said they'd seen me twice before and both times I'd fucked up and I had no excuse because I took my own sound guy. <laughs> feels like maybe one of the, <laughs> feels like maybe one of the gigs they're talking about was another dream, not tonight, but recently. Um, big crowd, small room, like a boxing ring. And that's, and I really remember like that whole thing. That's so visceral as well. It's such a real fear. Like, hey, I know that you're a musician and I'm not going to come to your show because I did come before and it was bad. Like that's something I genuinely fear happening at some point. What is your least favorite type of man? For example, mine is one who I'm serving at a restaurant and then they stop me to ask me how long until their food comes out. <laughs> Oh, I hate that. And I think that that man might be my granny. She would do that. <laughs> <laughs> um, my least favorite type of man. I've met two or three guys at shows that I played when I was younger, like a lot younger, before I had a band, before I was particularly confident playing the guitar. And I remember one guy coming up and he was like, yeah, I think you've got a really good voice, but 
I really would suggest that you get a man to play guitar so that you don't have to worry about it. Sure. And I was like, thank you, sir. <laughs> and also goodbye. Um, there's a lot of that. Like, I think, I don't know if I've been exposed to that kind of misogyny and like obvious, um, like being spoken down to. I don't really think I'm exposed to that in normal life. Cause I don't like, I've had a service job for like a year but I was like backstage. I didn't have to like actually talk to anyone because I was really shy. So I think that my main exposure to that kind of bad dude is is through music. And I think that maybe they think because you're on a stage, you're open to like life tips and like improvement from strangers, but it's always unwelcome mm -hmm. and it's never taken well. And also before I had a band, I didn't have anyone to stick up for me. Like now I've got my three guys in my band and like I'll have a merch guy to help me out so that if anyone does anything weird, I don't have to deal with it. But for a long time, I was just like, I hope that this, um, that my resting bitch face saves me from another conversation about like how I'm not doing the best I could do. Um, yeah, I also just hate guys who are like, I don't really wear condoms. <laughs> Like, yeah, you do. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah. So do you Those find my... that as you're getting more popular that more men have kind of, or even just like people with generally unsolicited opinions have like tried to talk to you and like give you weird advice? Or do you think that that's kind of gotten less as you get bigger? Uh, that's a really good question. I think, I think it's, become less not because I've become more successful but because my general vibe is less permeable I think I used to be I used to stand on I used to sit down when I played also which makes you look like less confident I think just subconsciously mm -hmm. I used to sit on a stool and like not speak between songs and generally look like I was uncomfortable in my skin which I was and then just slowly from getting more comfortable with the position I was in, I became more resilient. And I think that less people tried to kind of pick at me because it seemed like I was more prepared to deal with it. Um, but there's definitely, I constantly get messages on Instagram of people being like, um, I'm disappointed by how quiet your vocals were on this record. I, uh, or like, you shouldn't have worn that shirt for KEXP. You should have dressed a different way. And it's like, Okay, thanks. Um, but I think there's always going to be those people. Listen to the sun call. It's so I saw you um, in Jersey City when you opened up for Lucy Dacus. And it mm. was, first of all, one of the most peaceful shows I've ever been to. Um, <laughs> but also it was just so great I had never heard of you prior to that and then I saw you play and I was like she's pretty cool and then your stuff got sent to our radio station and we would play you on our show all the time um so if you could speak a little bit to like what it was like to tour with her or like any show rituals or favorite memories just like the general experience she firstly I was a huge fan of Lucy before I ever met her and when I was offered to do the first tour with her we toured twice together I meant to tour a third time this year but obviously I couldn't um but the first time I met her before we went on tour I had just I'd taken some stuff at a festival and I was like really hectic and I met her and I managed to like control my my panicky vibe but for the first couple of dates of that first tour with her, I was completely starstruck to the point where I like find it difficult, found it difficult to talk to her. But um, definitely the tour in the States, she's just the chillest, wisest person to the point where I was having three big life difficulties when we went, when we started that tour. Um, and one of them was signing to this label that I'm now signed to. I, I didn't know if I wanted to sign because I'd spent a really long time not being signed. And I released a record by myself and I didn't 
know if I was ready to take myself that seriously. Um, and she like acted in a, an essential role for me figuring out three of those really difficult things. She also brings a full library of books with her on tour for like anyone and everyone to read. Um, we, I think for that show, the Jersey show, we did a, an Alex G cover. Was that that show? Maybe not. I think right at the end of, right at the end of one of the shows, she did a cover of Bobby by Alex G and got our friend Xander to play violin and I did harmonies and that's just like her all over. She makes a concerted effort to make everything that she does feel communal and like everyone is appreciated. She also like organized all of our hotels and introduced me to my now manager and just as generally like a mother without the, I don't know, without being like fuddy duddy. She's so rad and wise and cool. Yeah, I can't speak ill of her in any capacity. She's, yeah. I want to be Lucy Dacus when I get older. <laughs> yeah. How do you, um, like touring with her and doing your bath time show. I, have you met Phoebe Bridgers in person? I have, yeah. So what's it kind of like now that you're, for lack of a better phrase, like kind of meeting your heroes? Um, the, well, the first time I did meet Phoebe, I, she came to a show that we played in LA and I knew she was coming, but I, didn't really notice that she was there because there were a few people and I wasn't really paying attention. And like halfway through one of the first songs, I realized that she was like right in the front row and I started sweating. And then I just didn't stop sweating until she left and we had like a chat outside and I felt like I was acting cool. I felt like I was keeping it together because I have been obsessed with the whole way she um, kind of operates like as much as but obviously her music is incredible and then she just manages to balance this brilliant sense of humor with like a very relaxed I don't know she just it feels like she's got every base covered so yeah I was sweating profusely and then I then she left and my bassist was like dude you look insane I was like dripping <laughs> um, but I think further than that it's just a cool feeling to know that what I'm doing is allowing me to, I don't know, be on a personal level with people whose work I appreciate and to have them appreciate my music as well as like a bonus. Mm -hmm. Like I think the label sent Phoebe the stream my record came out and she just kept sending me messages like, I'm obsessed with this song, this is sick. Like every few days, it was great and she's, yeah. It's a strange thing though, because I think I'll always feel like I'm not worthy of what's happening to me, just because that's kind of how I've felt forever. Like whenever anything goes right, I'm like, well, this will end at some point. This is, there's bad things to every good thing. Um, but yeah, I'm just trying to enjoy it. <laughs> yeah. It ended that in a really negative way. What do you do to kind of get yourself out of that imposter syndrome mindset? I don't know if I'm ever truly out of, out of it. Yeah, I think it's, I mean, it's difficult when, it's difficult to be completely, to completely back yourself when you know that there's loads of brilliant musicians, even in the city that you live in, who aren't getting a look in. Like my band is, comprised of three phenomenally talented musicians who have their own projects and those projects aren't I don't know like aren't getting the support that I think that they deserve and then I'm on stage with them and I feel sometimes like I'm the least deserving person in this room to be in the position that I'm in um, and I don't really have any context for it like as much as I worked shit jobs for a while. There wasn't that like 20 years of trying to make it and then finally it happened. Like it's, it kind of, I was lucky 
at the start for whatever reason and as much as I'm not like I didn't have like overnight massive success on a huge level I am aware that the way that I've the way that my career has panned out this far has been really blessed and I feel like I need to constantly remind myself of that um, but yeah it never really goes away I never wake up and I'm like oh I'm doing well and it's all because of me mm-hmm. I am aware that there's a lot of people that have got me to this place and at the same time I'm the only one that's going to keep it kind of going I need to pay attention to it and be thankful for stuff right. um, yeah so if I were to hand you an <laughs> Best new album of 2020 award. Who would mm. be your people you're thankful for? Wait, I'm getting the award? Yeah. Firstly, thank you so much. <laughs> uh, well, my I had a piano teacher for five years who actually wasn't really a real teacher. He was just my friend's dad. And I was a really reticent student. Like I didn't pay attention and I didn't practice and I didn't really, I wasn't as thankful as I should have been. He was giving me like free piano lessons and teaching me how to like home record and stuff. So I'd like to thank Rob McAvoy, firstly. Um, My Nana, she comes to all of my shows. She's like, I don't know how old she is. I think she just turned like 84. She's the smallest woman you've ever seen. She looks like a cocktail shrimp, but like with a really approachable face. She's so great. (laughs) <laughs> and um, she often will come to shows where I'm a bit drunk and I'm talking about like some Tinder date I went on and like some like pregnancy scare and she, she just takes it all and has tried. Um, and Joe, my guitarist, he, I never really let anyone into the writing process. I write everything by myself and I'm quite controlling about it, but I kind of gave him some leeway to write guitar parts for this record and He's a really intelligent player, like he doesn't overplay to prove that he can play. He's also my emotional rock on tour and I've had so many breakdowns. I broke my toe on the first day of recording in Chicago and he, yeah, he'll like go get me medication if I'm having like a a crippling hangover. Like he's just, he's a really good dude. So those, those people and obviously my parents and nobody from school. <laughs> That's the final, <laughs> final bit of the list. I'm going to live forever. <laughs> what is one question when you're doing interviews that you hate to be asked? Who's your biggest inspiration? I hate that. And I hate it because it makes me realize that I don't have any true idols mm-hmm. that have been on about two or three minutes. Like currently the people that I shake when I think about meeting are Frances from Hop Along and then I did that bath time interview with her and she's so chill and I shouldn't have been so scared. Her everything she makes I think is genius. Um yeah Lucy and like Phoebe and people that are currently making music right now. I didn't really get a music taste until I was like 18. So I feel like when anyone asks what's your inspiration, I feel like I should have some really like off kilter, off piste niche references, but I don't, I just, I mean, yeah, I'm uneducated in that regard and it makes me feel crap. Um, I also hate what's it like to be a female musician right now. I just think that that's not even worth wasting breath on. Because how would I know what it's like to be a a male musician? It's an impossible and also kind of derogatory question, (laughs) which I think nobody should ask. Do you have a song on Breach that you think is like an underdog that you liked a lot and you think it didn't get enough attention? Yeah, I do. I think, well, Laundry and Jetlag is the last song on the record and I, I don't ever really, the, the few reviews that I do read, I don't read all the reviews because I don't think it's important, but in a couple of reviews that I read, the one song that they were kind of picking apart negatively was Laundry and Jetlag. And I don't really think it deserved as much criticism as it got in the couple of things I read because they were kind of like, yeah, it's kind of, it's like a sweet 
gentle folk song, but I'm singing about like coughing up blood and like, mm-hmm. I don't know, being covered in dirt. So I don't know. But also that song, like instrumentally, I knew I wanted to have strings on the record. Um, and I added strings maybe to like three or four tracks quite subtly, but that was the one song that was so elevated by having those violins and cellos. And it made me cry when we recorded it. Like I went out of the room for a couple of hours. I didn't know what I was doing. I think I was fixing my guitar and I came back and they like basically tracked all the strings and I just burst into tears. It, and it feels like it kind of, it ends the record and it ends it on a point that feels really positive despite the fact that quite a lot of the thematic elements of the record are ultimately negative. <laughs> it feels like a, yeah, a, an essential piece of uplift. So yeah, that's my underdog choice. I think that on Breach, the song Birthday, especially the chorus of it, feels really cinematic to me for some reason. So my question to you is if your music, if it's going to be in a movie, who would you want to be in the cast? Ooh, that's such a good question. I would like to see Maya Rudolph in a serious role because I think she's incredibly funny Mm -hmm. and so beautiful. And I also, I want to see her in something where people are like, fuck, she's phenomenal. I don't know if she's done any serious films, like really like emotional films. Um, Maya Rudolph and Nicolas Cage. I recently watched um, Adaptation, I think it's called, Mm -hmm. where he plays Charlie Kaufman, the screenwriter. And um, who's the Devil Wears Prada woman? (laughs) Her name is completely gone from me. Meryl Streep? Exactly. Meryl Streep's in it. It's such a good film. He also plays his, his brother. It's so worth about a woman. <laughs> <laughs> I know, this is so bad. I hope she isn't listening. Um, <laughs> Nicolas Cage, Maya Rudolph. My third pick. I really love Greta Gerwig, and I think she gets a bad rap for some reason. I think people think she, because Mumblecore is ultimately the scene that she's in, I think it kind of splits opinion. Maybe it's taken less seriously than other forms of cinema. Mm -hmm. But I watched Frances Ha recently. Frances Ha, Frances Ha. And yeah, she's just brilliant. She makes me feel more confident Mm -hmm. in the things that maybe people find annoying about me. And I think that that's an important, she's an important person in that respect. Yeah, those are my picks. I was wondering, as I was listening through the album, um, 98, the song, I'm trying to figure out how to word this. I guess the question is, like, what makes you choose to put in a song almost entirely of, like, B-roll audio or, like, home movie audio as opposed to, like, lyrics and form? I really appreciate records that feel like they span a lot of different times Mm -hmm. and I felt like a lot of the songs on the record had an undertone of being hurt by the world that's generally what I have been focusing on when I write because I don't know it's just kind of my go-to feeling of general pain Um, and actually 98, we were recording the guitars for a different song and we were just like checking the mics and Joe started playing this little riff and then I joined in and we didn't know that Brian, our producer was recording secretly and just this really beautiful, spontaneous bit of weird guitar came out of it. And I'd been sitting on some tapes from when I was like one one and a half, two. And I thought it was kind of maybe cheesy to kind of try and shoehorn in some baby talking into songs that otherwise are about growth and like being old. (laughs) Um, And it kind of felt like the perfect combination of like spontaneity and 
a kind of reminder that at some point I was a new person who hadn't been hurt by anything. And it felt like it tied together a collection of songs from a point in my life where I was struggling. It gave kind of a reference point. But I, I mean, some of my favorite songs on records are ones that feel completely unrelated to the actual tone of the record. Like there's a, a record by Willie J. Healy that just came out. And there's like this weird kind of electronic song on the side of side A, on the end of side A. And it kind of like brings your attention back to the fact that you're listening to a record. I think if one record is not samey, but like if there's like an obvious sonic theme, it can become something that you kind of switch off and don't really listen to. It's nice when something kind of pulls you out of that and you're like, oh, dynamic. Um, yeah, that's a long answer to a short question. <laughs> what made you kind of bookend on hold with two different versions of Car Park as opposed to just picking one? Um, well, that was the last song to be written for the record and it almost didn't make it onto the record. Wow. And I didn't think I had time to re-record it. So I kind of had just decided that I would use the initial phone demo. Cause that, the last, yeah, the, the, the acoustic quiet version of Car Park on the record was literally just recorded on my phone. And then we luckily got some studio time with my friend and re-recorded it, but it didn't feel like, like it replaced the the song in my head. It still felt like the the demo was closer to capturing the immediacy of what I was feeling. Um, and honestly, I didn't have enough songs to like make the record feel complete. Mm -hmm. And I, I don't know, I just, I think a song recorded in two different ways is two different songs. Like it, it completely changes the way that you think about it. Um, and it felt like a really vulnerable song that maybe kind of, yeah, the, the vulnerability of that recording perfectly matches the vulnerability of where I was emotionally. So I didn't really want to leave it out for that reason. Um, but it is weird because if you play a CD, which nobody really does, and you let it just play around, like suddenly you, you have, yeah, you're listening to two two of the same song back to back. I don't know if that's enjoyable for people. I didn't really think about that. Do you ever get nervous writing songs about specific people knowing that they might hear it? No, I hope that they do hear it. And I'm actually cross that um, a couple of the songs on the record, the, the angriest songs, I used to take my body and birthday. I really expected both the people that those songs are about to contact and apologize, but even didn't. <laughs> um, but actually I did when I wrote Car Park I didn't expect the guy that it was written about to ever talk to me again and then I bumped into him last year at a party and we spent the evening like talking about how he had sent me down an emotional spiral of feeling ashamed and rubbish and he completely apologized for everything and I apologized for some stuff and we had a really nice cathartic postponed ending to that relationship which only came about because of me writing that song so that was like a positive thing to come out of writing a song about someone but sometimes I, wor I worry that I've written a song about one person and the wrong person will assume that it's about them and get really upset um, but ultimately I think it's kind of satisfying when you put something into the world and it makes someone who's bad feel bad <laughs> Let's finish up with some easy questions. Least favorite song ever? <laughs> Least favorite song ever. Uh, I, I was in a charity shop earlier and Girls Just Wanna Have Fun came on. I was like, no, we don't. <laughs> <laughs> I'm gonna pick that. <laughs> if anyone in the world, dead or alive, could cover your music, who would you want it to be? Ooh. 
Q-tip. Okay. Next question. <laughs> Favorite candle scent. Favorite candle scent. I'm confused and intrigued by fresh laundry. That's like a standard flavor of candle. And I always think, how can you assume that all of our laundry smells the same? So I'll buy them just to like see how different it can smell. Um, but my friend got me a, got me a, like a custom scented candle that she like designed for me and it was amazing. I don't know what went into it, but it did smell like me. So she did well. <laughs> well, this is Sweet. wonderful. Thank you so much for making the time for this. I appreciate it. Thank you for paying attention so closely to your questions. It's been a pleasure to answer them. Thank you. Enjoy the rest, of your, day. Day. And the rest of your day. Bye. Bye.